Hey everyone, nice to see you. Jarek Robbins here with my amazing, incredible, intelligent, passionate, strong, wonderful wife, Amanda Robbins. Thank you for joining me. Hello. Um, today we're talking about the difference between a team and just a meeting of individuals. And so a lot of times I coach businesses, we both coach businesses actually, and we hear people say like, oh, I'm going to go have a meeting with my team. And I'm gonna, I'll have my team work on that. I'll, I'll get together with my team and we'll, we'll, we'll get focused on this project. And they use the word team, 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 team. And often I'll at some point get curious. And my curiosity is, I wonder if they actually have a team. Not like that they have people that work for them. That's obvious, of course they do. But I'm wondering, is it actually a team or is it just a group of individuals that happen to be employed at the same place? And so today we're going to talk to two of the five differentiators between actually having a team versus employing a group of individuals that happen to work at the same place. There is a massive, massive difference. And so number one, let's just talk about this first one. And the first one to differentiate the difference between a team and a group of individuals who happen to be employed at the same location stems around their purpose and goals. And so if you would, Love, why don't you take us through the team side of it around purpose and goals? How does a team handle this topic? So as it relates to purpose and goals for teams, this is a group of individuals actually all working collaborative, co collaboratively <laughs> and beautifully um, rowing in the same direction. What it means here around purpose and goals is that they share long-term objectives with a collective commitment to a common mission. And they're able to work together to achieve specific outcomes. There's some key words here that I share that I just used, shared, collective, mission, common, and um, specific, they're, they're very clear on what it is that they're all focused on, what they're all doing together. Yeah. And they have deep meaning and purpose around it, shared goals around it, and they're truly in it together. And that's quite different than a meeting of individuals. Do you wanna share the meeting of individuals? So the meeting of individuals is often often focused on individual agendas or tasks with participants coming together temporarily to share information or updates without a sustained shared purpose. So this is what 90% of meetings actually are. People get together and it's saying, okay, here's the objective that we're working on. And someone chimes in and goes, well, here's my task I have, and here's my task I have, and here's my agenda, and here's yours. And it's all this separate pieces that are not collectively combined or aligned or in any way integrated. And it's just a bunch of individuals working on their own things. What's the simplest test in this case around purpose and goals to find out if you have a team or just a group of meeting of individuals is ask people, what's the outcome we're here to achieve? And let them quickly answer. And if you notice that every person in your meeting has a different outcome, clearly you're not working on the same project. You're not working in the same direction. Uh, it's the equivalent, Amanda used the concept of rowing in the same direction. It's like if you all got in a boat and the first person in the front row is gonna be rowing forward and the person uh, behind them is just not rowing and the person behind them is rowing backwards, like your boat's just going to turn in circles. There's no way you're going to get this thing moving in the right direction. And so when it comes to purpose and goals, keywords, shared long-term objective, collective commitment to a common mission, working together to, a to achieve a specific outcome. Those are three pieces that you know. If those aren't present, you're not working as a team, period. And so I would sit down and look at every meeting you have coming up with your team and ask, do we have a shared long-term objective? Are we committed to a common mission? Do we have a very specific outcome that all of us are committed to accomplishing from this meeting? If you don't, you're just a meeting of individuals. 
And the, the difference here is imagine, I mean, pick a sport. It's kind of an easy way to do it. I was thinking football. I was thinking football. Like there's so many players on the field with football. Yep. And if they all were just focused on themselves, their own outcome, their own agenda, right? Their own points or scoreboard, right? It would be they, their own stats. They're more concerned with what with their, their stats look stats. like. Yeah than they are of the team winning. Right. And so someone's more concerned about getting uh, a tackle or a touchdown or a catch or a, a pass. Like they're more concerned with getting their own personal points on the board and what their resume is going to look like, what their job opportunities will happen, how much money they're going to make from it. They're so concerned with themselves. They're not paying attention to anything that's going on with the team. The other piece is, and we'll cover this in point three probably tomorrow, is how they interact with someone else. Meaning, um, when it comes to collaboration and communication, do they only think that they're in charge of their part? Right. Meaning, exactly. I've done my part. I'm done. I'll just what wait. It, you'll hear things like, um, that's not my job description. That's above my pay grade or below my pay grade, things yep. like that, that are just disconnecting them from the overall outcome and goal of the whole, yep. of the whole team. And it creates, like Jarek said, a completely different environment, a completely different culture where we're not in it to win it for the whole. And after this mission together, it's just so focused on the individual and them kind of winning the awards or the praise or the accolades. When the truth is, if they're only focused on themselves, you have, again, a boat not moving or spinning in circles instead of going towards the finish line or where they're, where they're meant to go. And what I've seen in the highest performing teams, the, the best teams, what I have seen when they are truly in it together, the difference has been they – even if another job opportunity came along and was willing to pay them more, the culture in which was a true high performing team that had shared goals, shared purpose, shared alignment, a shared vision, they were willing to stick it through even the roughest times with that company because of the culture there, right? On the other hand, I've seen companies where they it was all about the individual and their performance and they didn't play like a team there i've seen a lot of um a lot of turnover for sure uh and really um crappy morale where it was just like an eye for an eye kind of thing like no one really it was like a extremely competitive to a point where it was counterproductive and uh, again created a really high churn rate of employees or, or turnover, excuse me. Quick question of the day. I'm going to throw it in here before we hit point number two. Question of the day is right here. Think of the best team you've been a part of, whether it's a work team, a, a study team, a sports team, a family team, whatever team, the best team you've been a part of, Navy SEAL team, special operator team. What's the best team you've ever been a part of? And real quick, I want to capture what made it a great team in your perspective? What is the best team you've ever been a part of and what made it a great team in your perspective? You'll notice, and I, I've asked this question lots and lots of people, when you sit down and capture what made it a great team, so often you'll hear a lot of the things we're going to talk about over the next couple of days. You'll just see those are trademark staple features of a great team. And then my question is, how often do you show up bringing those characteristics with you? It's really important. Really, really important. Because often we wait for someone else to show up as a teammate versus showing up and being the type of teammate that causes and inspires others to be like, dang, I'm going to show up like them because look how much they're bringing. Look how they step up. Look how they support people. Look how they help us get clarity. Look how they help us win the game. Look how they go above and beyond. Like it takes that leader. So at Performance Coach University, we help create those leaders, people to come and learn these tools, who apply it to their own life, who start to take that first step ahead of most people 
and then they become that team leader. So if you're interested in being a phenomenal and world-class team leader, make sure to go to performancecoachuniversity.com forward slash apply. Check that out because we create world-class leaders. Uh, point two, I know we're tight on time today. So point two is roles and responsibility. Point one was purpose and goals, the difference between a team versus just a meeting of individuals. Point two is roles and responsibilities. Let's start off with the difference between a team versus meeting of individuals. Love, if you'd cover the team part. When it comes sure. to roles and responsibilities, what are the characteristics that really define a team? So for roles and responsibilities, a true team clearly defines the roles and responsibilities that leverage individual strengths and contribute to the overall team goals and promote synergy. The key here that I love is individual strength. So you are crystal clear on the strengths of every player on your team or your colleagues or whoever it is in your community. You're very clear on what their strengths are and you have roles and responsibilities that really allow them to lead with their strengths, right? A lot of times we forget to do this and we just put people into positions. A great performing team is clear on, I see your strengths and I see your superpowers. This is your role and responsibility to help leverage those and bring those to life that help the team's overall goals be achieved. The most important piece with this is right person, right roles and responsibilities. And so often, if you think of as a company grows, as a company grows, generally they'll ask people to take on more and more responsibilities. And so one question is, you might have started off having a team yeah. and accidentally grew into a meeting of individuals. Because you've, you've prioritized growth, what happens is you've stretched your people out of their center of genius into auxiliary tasks that are not their core strength. Yeah. And now you have people working so hard to just get it done because it has to. And we're a team that does what it takes, these kind of statements. And the challenge is you start to create a scenario where they become so focused on getting their tasks done. Otherwise, they feel like they're going to be fired yeah. or removed or replaced that you've drowned them out. You've diluted them out of their core strengths. And so for a real team there's clearly defined roles and responsibilities that leverage individual strengths that contribute to the whole. So you know what their greatest strengths are. You know if they're a fast runner. You know if they're a high jumper. You know if they're a big blocker. You know if what they're good at. And you've placed them in the position where their strengths shine. This is so, so, so important. And vice versa. I was talking to my dad one time and we were talking about possibly purchasing a company together. And, you know, if you would go back years ago, there was a part of me that always wanted to be on the big stage. I thought that would be the coolest thing ever. Um, at this stage of my life, I've been on the big stage, you know, knock on wood, and it's great. And I know he said, hey, if we buy the company, we'll put you on the stage and, and you'll be the one representing it. I said, dad, that's ridiculous. How we figure out who needs to go on stage is the person who gets the best results for the people listening and the highest conversion. Like if that's me, great, happy to do it, love to. If it's not, there's no part of me that would hesitate in saying, put them on. They're giving the client a better experience. They're getting better results. They're getting better conversions. Put them on all day long. And what's funny is that ability to step back and say, hey, Put the best person in. Put the person that will cause the result to happen. I don't care if it's me, you, anyone else. Put the person in that's going to cause us to win as a team versus move. I want on the stage. I want to shine. I want to be up in front. I want to do it. It's my turn. I'm hungry. Move out of my way. Uh, and, and so this is where ego really defeats the team. Are you willing to drop your ego? Are you willing to set aside your own agenda? Are you willing to say, hey, what's best for the team? What causes this team to function at the highest capacity? And where can I participate where my, where my greatest strengths can really support the team's outcome? In roles and responsibilities, if you just have a meeting of individuals, 
Participants may have roles defined only within the scope of the meeting with less emphasis on complementary strengths or collaborative achievement. And so they show up and they say, hey, what can I do in this meeting? The, the meeting, really simple. Uh, there's one thing they can do to help out with. They'll do it, but it's not what they want to do or they're frustrated they have to do it. I'll remember, I can give you a specific example. Um, and this was when we didn't have a team. I was working with another organization and the owner of the company asked someone to help complete a uh, something that was in her department. And she straight up said no. It, it, was, <laughs> it was a responsibility that belonged to her department, to her strength, what she was good at. And her response was no, she's not going to do it. And she got really frustrated and she went to the person, her manager, her supervisor, her direct report. She went to her and she says, that's ridiculous. He could do it himself. I don't care if he's the owner or not. I'm not going to do that. He needs to figure out how to get it done. And when we asked why, she said, it's not in my job description. This, I mean, and we looked at that and we said, that's really interesting. It's her strength. It's what she's good at. She can do it better than any of us. We would all be more efficient as a team if she did it. But because it wasn't written in the job description or outlined prior to, she was a hard no. And she said, he needs to figure it out himself. And I was like, wow, she's willing to own her tasks on an island separate from the whole. And if the whole needs anything beyond what was written in the scope of work, she's not interested. I was like, ah, that's definitely not a signal of a team. That's not someone who's saying, hey, that's my strength, pass it to me. And ah, I have something on my plate that's not my strength, but it's yours, let me pass it to you. So think about it of with roles and responsibilities, have you crafted them in a traditional way where you just wrote down, here's what someone in this role would do? Or have you adapted them to the strengths of your team? This is the strongest person on our team in this category. Therefore, we're going to take a few responsibilities and move them over here. And here's where it's not their strength. We're going to move those responsibilities over to the person whose strength that is. Sometimes you have to rearrange traditional roles and responsibilities to actually make sure the person who's strongest at that on the team is the one doing that work. It's really important if you want to see your team shine and get to a team of high performance. You don't have your slowest person trying to do the sprint. You don't have your super weightlifter trying to run long distance. Like you put the right person in the right position. Person with lots of strength, they're lifting the heavy weights. Person who can run long distances, they're the one running the miles. Like it, it, it's right person, right position. This is so very important, and, and a lot of companies mess up on this. Um, mainly, and this is a whole different live we'll do, but mainly the reason they mess up is they hire for a position instead of hiring for an outcome. This one adjustment will make a massive difference in your organization. Hiring for a position versus hiring for outcome. If you're hiring for an outcome, you're going to reverse engineer who the person needs to be, what strengths they need, how they need to show up in order to hit an outcome. If you're hiring for a position, you're going to hire for someone to fill in a role and hopefully handle a bunch of things that someone in that role would handle. And you need to flip that and make sure you're hiring for outcomes. Anyways, we got to wrap up, but hopefully this is interesting Again, the question of the day was, think of the best team you've been a part of and ask, what made it a great team? What were the characteristics you observed that made it a great team? Uh, we, we covered number one, which is the purpose and goals, team versus meeting of individuals. Number two, roles and responsibilities, team versus meeting individuals. Tomorrow, we're going to cover uh, point three, four, and five and keep moving forward. If you enjoyed this, make sure to share it. 
Also, if you're a team leader and you really want to own more skills and tools to better lead your team, uh, make sure to go to performancecoachuniversity.com forward slash apply. We'd love to hear from you and have a great day, everyone. Bye.